This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Turkey's Erdogan sets his sights on northeast Syria, calling Christians and other U.S. allies there terrorists. Plus, 40 years since the Iranian Revolution, and the terror influence just keeps growing. And champion of Jewish-Christian relations Rabbi Eckstein dies at 67. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl filling in for Chris Mitchell. When President Trump first announced U.S. troops would leave Syria, it sent shockwaves through the region. Turkish President Erdogan threatened to invade northeast Syria, where a number of ethnic minorities, including thousands of Christians, live, and claiming he'd be fighting terrorists. Chris Mitchell recently traveled there to talk to those in the path of this potential storm. The people of this region saw almost immediately the effect of President Trump's announcement. The impact of the withdrawal of the U.S. forces is mainly because the Turks have started threatening us. This is the Turkish-Syrian border. Behind me, you can see the Turkish flag flying. One proposal is that Turkey would control a 20-mile security zone all along the Turkish-Syrian border. For most of the people we talked to said that would lead to a disaster. Most of our uh, Christian people lives in this area, and mm. if any military operation happened in this area, it will be real uh, fear on our people. Yet Erdogan insists on this security zone. We expect the promise to establish a safe zone to be fulfilled within a few months to ensure our country is protected from terrorists on our borders. Otherwise, we will establish this buffer zone ourselves. Those terrorists are actually U.S. allies who fought together to drive out ISIS. While Erdogan typically only mentions the Kurds, northeast Syria is also home to Christians, Arabs, Yazidis, and other minorities. This melting pot has now established a new democracy here. And now he wants to control the entire region. So he uses the pursuit of ISIS as his pet project, as smokescreen, to get at the rest of us. And that's why he sees democracy as a danger. Recently, Erdogan set his sights on this part of northeast Syria, east of the Euphrates, saying when it is cleared for militants, the millions of people will have a chance to return to their homes. He made similar statements last year before his army, which is part of NATO, overran the Syrian city of Afrin. Along with jihadist mercenaries, it displaced hundreds of thousands while searching for Christians and burning churches. Some see that invasion and this year's push for the security zone as part of Erdogan's vision to revive the Ottoman Empire. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Turkish-Syrian border. Forty years ago, a radical Iranian cleric known as the Ayatollah led the overthrow of his country's government and installed an Islamist regime. That regime still stands and is the world's leading sponsor of terror. As John Waggy explains, Israel remains on the front lines of the battle to prevent Iran from expanding westward and destroying the Jewish state. In 1979, the world was introduced to the menacing glare of the Ayatollah Khomeini. His Iranian revolution ousted the Shah of Iran, a U.S. ally, and put its mark on American history with a hostage crisis that lasted more than a year. Its leaders began to purge the country of Western influence and set Iran on a path of expansion and Islamist terror. During the revolution, the U.S. was dubbed the Great Satan by the ruling mullahs. Still, most of their hatred was reserved for the country they called the Little Satan, Israel. For four decades, they have vowed to wipe it off the map. The show of force continued this month as Iran paraded its missiles in Tehran. I think a clash is inevitable. Middle East expert Michael Widlansky says according to Israeli military sources, Iran has armed Hezbollah in Lebanon with enough missiles to bombard all of Israel for weeks. Lebanon itself is so well armed with Hezbollah missiles and rockets that Israel could face every day not 10 rockets, not 100 rockets, but 2,500 rocket attacks every day over a period of three weeks. And that doesn't take into account Iran's nuclear program. 
In last year's UN address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu exposed a secret nuclear site with 300 tons of nuclear material. Now, I also have a message today for the tyrants of Tehran. Israel knows what you're doing, and Israel knows where you're doing it. Israel will never let a regime that calls for our destruction to develop nuclear weapons. Not now, not in 10 years, not ever. While Widlansky warns Israel can take care of itself, he worries if the mullahs aren't stopped, their grand design could swallow up the region. The Iranians want Shia Islam to be the face of Islam. That means they want to go after Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait. They want to go after all their neighbors and project their force all the way to the Mediterranean and to the Atlantic. They want to go through Lebanon and then through North Africa. They want to go through Yemen. They have a real, real expansionist process, which is similar to what the communists and the Nazis had. This is not just a religious calling. This is very serious power politics strategy playing. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. Israel and the world has lost a champion of Jewish-Christian relations. Rabbi Yechiel Eckstein, founder of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, was laid to rest in Bet Shemesh outside Jerusalem. CBN's John Wagi has that story. Hundreds came to pay tribute to the man known as the ultimate bridge builder. Mourners included U.S. Ambassador David Friedman and former Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat. He was a man who understood the true hardships and challenges that exist for us and the distress in the state of Israel and how to open the hearts of millions of donors around the world. Rabbi Eckstein started the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews in 1983. Since then, it's raised more than one and a half billion dollars to help Jews in Israel, the former Soviet Union, Latin America, and more than 58 other countries. I think from the very beginning, I remember when my brother went out to Chicago for the march in Skokie. It was the first start, the start of anti-Semitism in a different way in America. And the partners he found were the evangelical Christians. Eckstein's daughter Yael carries on the family legacy as the global executive vice president. There's one specific gift, Abba, which is the greatest gift I've received from you. It's the commitment to hold family over everything else in the world. Eckstein's younger brother, Beryl, told CBN News that the more he saw his brother's work, the more he understood and loved it. Wherever you feel went, there was a bond, especially with Pat Robertson, who was such an influence on Yechiel's life, and I think Yechiel was on his. That love, that shared mission, was something that I and my whole family cherish. Eckstein pursued three goals, build bridges between Christians and Jews, deepen Christian understanding of the Jewish roots of their faith, and develop a practical way to help the Jewish people and Israel. Jonathan Feldstein learned much from the rabbi's work. I wasn't working with him as an employee, but we were working together. We were doing the same thing, building bridges between Jews and Christians, and, and he was a mentor because he, set, he created the mold. Eckstein's group also helped others like persecuted Christians in the Middle East and in Israel, indigenous Aramaic Christians. I am here as well to give a message to all the world and to everyone include his organization, that we are still here in order to guarantee the cooperation between Christian and Jews as it should be in this world. Rabbi Eckstein is survived by his wife, Joel, three daughters, and eight grandchildren. The memory I always have of my brother is him praying, and whenever I was weak, he was always there to hold my hands. That's my memory of my brother holding my hand, and me holding his. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, Trump joined by Holocaust survivors for the State of the Union Address. In President Trump's State of the Union Address, he said, the vile poison of anti-Semitism must never be ignored. To accent his point, he was joined in the U.S. Capitol by Holocaust survivors. 
Just months ago, 11 Jewish Americans were viciously murdered in an anti-Semitic attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. SWAT officer Timothy Matson raced into the gunfire and was shot seven times chasing down the killer, and he was very successful. Timothy has just had his 12th surgery, and he's going in for many more. But he made the trip to be here with us tonight. Officer Matson, please. Thank you. We are forever grateful. Thank you very much. Tonight, we are also joined by Pittsburgh survivor Judah Sabbat. He arrived at the synagogue as the massacre began. But not only did Judah narrowly escape death last fall, more than seven decades ago, he narrowly survived the Nazi concentration camps. Today is Judah's 81st birthday. Judah says he can still remember the exact moment nearly 75 years ago, after 10 months in a concentration camp, when he and his family were put on a train and told they were going to another camp. Suddenly, the train screeched to a very strong halt. A soldier appeared. Judah's family braced for the absolute worst. Then his father cried out with joy, it's the Americans, it's the Americans. Thank you. A second Holocaust survivor who is here tonight, Joshua Kaufman, was a prisoner at Dachau. He remembers watching through a hole in the wall of a cattle car as American soldiers rolled in with tanks. To me, Joshua recalls, the American soldiers were proof that God exists, and they came down from the sky. They came down from heaven. I began this evening by honoring three soldiers who fought on D-Day in the Second World War. One of them was Hermann Zajcik. But there is more to Hermann's story. A year after he stormed the beaches of Normandy, Hermann was one of the American soldiers who helped liberate Dachau. He was one of the Americans who helped rescue Joshua from that hell on Earth. Almost 75 years later, Herman and Joshua are both together in the gallery tonight, seated side by side here in the home of American freedom. Herman and Joshua, your presence this evening is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Up next, changing U.S. policy in the Middle East. Chris Mitchell is on assignment in Washington, D.C. He sat down on the set of CBN's program Faith Nation with hosts John Jessup and Jenna Browder. They talked about their new program and how the Trump administration has changed U.S. policies toward Israel and the Middle East. John Jessup, Janet Browder, great to be with you here on the Faith Nation set. And uh, tell us about, for the people that watch Jerusalem Dateline, 
Uh, tell us what Faith Nation is and where they can watch it. Yeah, so Faith Nation is a show that we do d uh, Monday through Friday, 30-minute uh, newscast, and it really kind of crosses uh, faith and politics. It's the intersection of those two things. Mm -hmm. So here in Washington, especially right now, CBN News has just tremendous access to yeah. this administration and to so many lawmakers and different people. So we thought it would be a timely, uh, it would be a great time to do this news program and and um, and be hopefully mm -hmm. our, what we strive to be is a, a voice of truth and mm -hmm. in a sea of a lot of chaos. Yeah, and what I really love about our show is we just have so many people who contribute to mm -hmm. what we do in the newsroom and we have so much talent and as Jenna was saying, uh, more access than we've had in the past. So right. we're able to uh, utilize all these voices, all these different talents, whether it's Abigail Robertson on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill or Ben uh, Kennedy at the White House, of course, David Brody, our chief political analyst, Jennifer Wishon. Uh, we just have a, a vast team right. and we're able to showcase that a lot more than we are sometimes with our programming that's a little more limited because of time with the 700 Club mm -hmm. and, and, and other platforms. Cool. In some ways, it's a rallying call or, or a clarion call to those who are people of faith to watch the show so that we can inform them on matters that are important uh, to them, uh, to their religious liberties, to uh, social uh, issues, or to legislation. It's, it's kind of a rallying call or a rallying cry to say, mm -hmm. listen, this matters and this is important for your faith. Yeah, would you say, Jenna, at this time, there seems to be a lot, so much in the news about faith, mm -hmm. uh, either attacks against Christians, uh, persecuted Christians, but here in the United States as well, religious freedom seems to be uh, under assault, so the, the show seems to be very timely. Yeah, absolutely, and we see the president, President Trump, uh, standing strong for religious freedom yeah. in so many ways. This morning he was at the National Prayer Breakfast, gave a very uh, riveting speech, mm -hmm. and he mentioned, of course, uh, uh, religious freedom and Pastor Andrew Brunson, uh, who was just released from Turkish prison after two years mm -hmm. there. So this president, uh, he is really shining a spotlight on that, and we also uh, that's a big, a big, um, uh, our audience has a big interest yeah. in religious liberty. It's mm -hmm. very important to Christians and, and people of all faith. You know, it, it really is true. There can be no religious freedom if that religious freedom is not for all people. Yeah. So we try to cover that. It's an important issue along with so many others for our audience. Yeah. You've both been here for a number of years. Have you seen a change, uh, talking about Jerusalem Dateline and, and the Middle East, yeah. a change in policy towards Israel? towards persecuted Christians in the Middle East and in the Middle East in general Certainly. in the last two years. Certainly. I think there's been a significant change. You know, as Jenna was talking, um, you know, it, it, President Obama was a, an avowed Christian, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of Christians questioned how he lived his faith because he didn't push um, Christian values and, and Christian concerns to the fore of his administration. Mm -hmm. It was always um, uh, other groups. And uh, you see with um, President Trump how he has embraced evangelicals and the evangelical cause. Uh, even in his speech, he started uh, at the National Prayer Breakfast by saying, I always will deliver for you. I will mm -hmm. always have your back. Uh, so we've seen a, a huge sea change. And um, I, I think he's redirected the focus towards issues that are very important uh, to evangelicals, to Christians, one of which has to do with Israel. Sure. Uh, the policy mm -hmm. has changed drastically, and I think he's brought it to the fore again mm -hmm. uh, with the big move to the embassy in Jerusalem. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there. In you, fact, you were uh, there yeah. along, uh -huh. and you mm -hmm. got to cover that with yeah. with uh, the administration officials who were there, Jared and Ivanka, mm -hmm. uh, representing the president. So it, it's just really brought, again, um, something very different than what we've seen in the last... I, I, I've been here for 15 years, and I've seen nothing like it. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. it's been tremendous yeah. to, to watch. We see that, uh, you know, standing up for persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. One of the first interviews uh, the president made was with David Brody, and mm -hmm. uh, he asked him that question about uh, persecuted Christians, said he would stand with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a huge change. And thank you that you, uh, Jenna and John, are covering it here from Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and so people can watch you on the CBN News Channel, uh -huh. uh, Faith Nation, uh, five days a week, as That's well right. as uh, Jerusalem Dateline. So That's it's right. great to be with you here in, uh, in Washington, and you got to come over to Jerusalem next oh, time, love okay? That. Still ahead. See how CBN is helping Israelis fight Hamas terror on the Gaza border.
For nearly a year, Israelis living along the Gaza border have been battling fires set by Hamas terror kites and other devices, many times without proper equipment. That's when CBN stepped in to help. Israeli communities near Gaza face a new threat, fire kites and balloons. Terrorists have used the devices to burn more than 10,000 acres of land. We raise our children to be good people and to love their land. And then they see that the other side doesn't care about the land and they want to burn it. Harel is head security coordinator for his kibbutz, and he's the first line of defense in this latest fight. Over the years, we have learned how to deal with the bombs and the attack tunnels. But these fire balloons are a disaster because the wind carries the fire so fast. Harel didn't have the proper equipment to fight fires. He only wore everyday clothes and shoes to battle the blazes. That left his wife Karen and their three children constantly worried for his safety. When you have kids, you have to smile and say, everything's going to be OK. But if you don't really believe it, then they recognize it. And you can just feel the level of anxiety uh, rising up in the house. We were exposed to a lot of smoke, and we had to have oxygen treatment. Other security coordinators were burned as direct consequence of not having proper equipment. So CBN Israel took action to help. We bought more than two dozen firefighting equipment kits for Harel and others at nearby kibbutz. The kits include custom firefighting suits, boots, gloves, respirators, goggles, hats, and blankets. Now we are better equipped to fight these fires and defend our homes and communities. To know that he's safe and I know that his body is protected, it's really nice and calming for me. Thanks to CBN Israel, Harel is able to stay safe while protecting his land and family. I want this land and nature to be around for my children to enjoy. With your help, I believe we can do this. From the bottom of my heart, we are so grateful and I will never forget it. Thank you. <laughs> That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Remember to pray for the Middle East Christians who are oftentimes in harm's way and for the peace of Jerusalem. And remember, the God who's watching over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.